people say that the Son of Man is? When Jesus asked that question to his disciples in today's Gospel reading, he received many answers. If we asked random people on the street, we would likely get several responses as well. Some biblically based, some personally based, and some influenced by what individuals have heard from others. The answers would be in a range from not even close to right on the money. The same is probably true for us. Throughout our lives, we probably understood Jesus in different ways. For example, as a young child, Jesus may have been someone akin to Santa Claus, a good person we don't see but hope for. As a teen, maybe he was someone we knew was there because we were told so in church, we were, but we weren't sure how to form a relationship with a presence we couldn't see. As adults, he might be someone we call on in dealing with the struggles of life or when we need to be redeemed from our actions. Or maybe our understanding of Jesus is something entirely different. Throughout the gospel, we hear who Jesus is in many ways. In John's account, Jesus says he is the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate for sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and the way and the truth. There are times we also hear Jesus just say, I am. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus applauds Peter for being the first to correctly respond that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus states that it was God that opened Peter's mind to understand this. This is significant because Jesus being the Messiah is not something that was observed. It was revealed. While we have been told and believe that Jesus is the Messiah, it has been revealed to us throughout our lives as well. Maybe we didn't always see it. Today, we have the gospel and a whole bunch of definitions of who Jesus is. It doesn't always make it easy to explain to someone who Jesus is if they don't believe and what it means to be the Messiah. Certainly, we can say that Jesus is the one who God sent to teach us how to love, to suffer and die for us, to be resurrected and to send in a, into heaven. To someone who really doesn't know anything about Jesus or understand Jewish history, honestly, that's got to sound ridiculous. Perhaps reflecting on who Jesus is to each of us individually may make it easier to answer that question for a non-believer. Since the second Sunday in Pentecost, our epistle reading has been from the book of Romans, with a little pause at the beginning of this month for the transfiguration reading. For a while, we've been hearing Paul explain the gospel. In today's reading, it changes. But in the first verse, Paul appeals to the reader. He asks that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We know that through God's love and grace, he sent Jesus to suffer and die for us. His greatest gift is Christ. It is important to understand how the gift of his son separated the lives of those from the Old Testament to the people of the New Testament, and for us now. See, in the Old Testament, people provided dead sacrifices. They brought animals to the temple, which a priest would kill, and then that sacrifice was an atonement for sin. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, we no longer have to offer dead sacrifices to God. Instead, we offer ourselves as living, breathing sacrifices. We do that by offering our bodies and our intentions and all we do according to God's will. 
And we are made holy and acceptable living sacrifices because Jesus also lives. Not only is Paul telling us to be living sacrifices to God, but to remember that Jesus, in his sacrifice, changed us. The humanity of the past died with Jesus, and the new humanity rose along with him. Our outline of faith tells us that baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us in union with Christ's death and resurrection and a birth into God's family, the church. So the new humanity that rose with Christ is what we all become part of when we join Jesus in holy baptism. We become part of him as we join together in the community of the church. We will all get to participate in a baptism in just a few minutes. We will be reminded of our covenant with the Lord and that we are a redeemed people. As a redeemed people, God gives us the opportunity to be the living sacrifices that Paul wrote about, even though that God doesn't need us to do so. Think about it. Does God really need a sacrifice? No. However, truly loving God requires that we do so. Love often leads us to sacrifice. We give our time, abilities, and treasures to others all of the time. Has anyone ever shared a piece of cake with a child and given them the bigger half? Have you ever brought food to someone who needed it and it eased their situation? Have you ever dropped everything and went running to help someone you love because they needed you, even though you didn't really think you had the time? Maybe all you did was listen. All are wonderful acts of love and sacrifice. And as we've heard before, love is an action. Perhaps reflecting back, we realize in those moments that the, when we sacrifice something, we were the ones who were blessed. Paul stated that, allowing, that God is allowing us to do the same thing, to show our love to God by some sort of action that is becoming living sacrifices. We know our love and sacrifice could never measure up to God's. But fortunately, it's not a comparison between God and us or between each other. In the same reading where we are called to be living sacrifices, we are told that we all have been given special gifts. We each, with a unique gift, are called to act in unison according to those gifts given to us as the body of the church, the same church that Jesus is the head of and sacrificed to create. Of course, none of that is easy, or at least easy all of the time. It is, however, what God created us for, and it is how we live into our very best selves. It makes us more like Christ than anything else could, and likely is where we realize our biggest blessings. Additionally, it is not something we are to do alone. Our hearts and minds must choose daily to live with the intention of giving all of ourselves fully to God. Through the Holy Spirit who lives within each of us and guides us, and through the love and support of each other, we are able to do this. One commentary I read stated, that when we offer ourselves to God, it pleases him. It is because when God sees us, he sees Jesus. I fell in love with that quote simply because the idea that God sees Jesus in me is amazing. So are we all supposed to stop living the lives we currently have and live as monks, praying five times a day, Reflecting on God constantly and shunning anything that is not of God? No, except maybe that last part of shunning all that is not of God. Oh, some people are called to monks, to be monks, but what being a living sacrifice means to the rest of us 
is to forgo our own desires and to follow God's desire for us. The Bible and spending time in, with, with God in prayer is the best way I know of to understand what good God's desire is. Then in every act we do, whether it is working, service, activities that we enjoy, whatever, it should be done so in a way that others also see Jesus in us. The things we have and the activities we love to do are fine, but they cannot be more important than following Jesus. And of course, we need to remember to be united as a body of Christ and follow Jesus together. While Jesus as the Messiah was revealed by God, we reveal ourselves as members of Christ's body by our actions, by being his arms and legs. One of my favorite worship songs, and I think it's applicable here, is We Are One in the Spirit, where the chorus exclaims, and they know we are Christians by our love. Although there are similar similarities between our instructions and those given to the disciples, at this point in the gospel, the disciples are told to keep their new knowledge of Jesus as the Messiah a secret. Since our own baptisms, our instructions have been different. We are told to tell the whole world. In the next few weeks, we will continue listening to Romans where we will get instructions on what each of us should do to show that we are Christians by our love. However, we must also show how we are part of the body of Christ by giving of ourselves and using the unique gifts given to each of us for the good of the church. Our gifts are equally important and require us as living sacrifices to function. As we continue to come to know who Jesus is, may we constantly be reminded who we are in the body of the church that Jesus built and be able to say, I am a living sacrifice. Amen.